This report brought to you by the Richmond Club, where investors and high growth companies meet. Okay, thank you, Michael. And our next presenter is the president and CEO of CUDA Oil and Gas, Glenn Dawson. Good afternoon, and uh, thanks for coming out. It's always good to come to uh, Toronto, my hometown. Uh, haven't lived here for 40 years, but it's always great to get back. We're down here uh, doing a little marketing trip for CUDA. Um, what is CUDA? CUDA is a company I started a couple of years ago uh, in Alberta. Uh, it was a private company and uh, we basically have uh, evolved from a private funded, internally funded company into now a public company. Just recently we did a, a, a takeover of a Canadian company called Junex, which had assets in Quebec. And uh, we've now diversified our asset base into the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. I'm going to walk you through the, the total asset base, but our current focus is on Wyoming. My background is geology. I've been, uh, went to school in Utah, I did a master's degree in the University of Calgary, and I've been living in Calgary ever since. Uh, the last 20 years, um, me and my staff have been running around building TSX listed companies and I'm going to run you through our track record and show you the companies we've built. Perhaps you've invested in some of them in the past and talk a little bit about our organic growth strategy, cradle to grave and how we build and sell companies. But uh, right now we're basically completely focused in Wyoming in the Powder River Basin. We produce about 1,200 barrels a day of production, 50% liquids. Um, we have cash, we have cash in the balance sheet. We actually just closed the financing last week of $7.2 million, which we found uh, which was quite extraordinary in, in today's market. We're continuing to, to market that financing. We have an open-ended financing, which is probably going to wrap up about the second week of December. Just a little bit of the corporate snapshot. Uh, we did the merger uh, with, with Junex, uh, basically to control the lowland Judica play and control the cash in the company to take over the Wyoming asset. When we went public, we were trading around $4. We had about 19 million shares outstanding. Uh, currently, you know, with the market conditions, you know, our stock has fallen off with, with the energy sector. But I like to build companies that have very low share counts, um, backed up by solid reserves. Most of our reserves are proven. We have hardly any probable. We have massive resource contingent reserves in Quebec, which may or may never get developed, but we're not really, that's not part of our game plan and really has no value to us. What does a lot, add a lot of value is our land position in Wyoming, which is significant. And uh, I'll walk you through the valuation on, on that property. So currently producing great cash flow. We're, we're doing about a million a month in, in cash flow uh, between our joint properties. A little bit about me and the team. Um, the team is still together. These are some of the companies we built uh, in the last 20 years and, and sold. Um, I spent over 12 years at Summit growing that from 200 barrels a day to 14,000. Uh, I started another company with two gentlemen called Pan Atlas. We, we sold that in two years to El Paso. The same gentleman and I started a company called Trilock with nothing. Grew that to 1,500 barrels a day and sold it to Interplus. Uh, for $87 million. We spun out an AB deal uh, with the help of GMP and started New Lock. And uh, we sold that. Went, that one went through the, through the recession. Um, and we, went, we came out of that quite nicely, built a position in Saskatchewan and North Dakota. And we turned that for $327 million. Uh, all of these companies have great rate of return for the in initial investor. Um, I'm currently uh, the lead technical director for a Permian-based company called Lillis Energy, which I started with, with two other gentlemen. I'm a uh, lead technical director and on the board. Basically, was involved in acquiring the asset in the Delaware Basin of the Permian. And we've turned that to a 6,000 barrel a day company in 18 months, listed on New York Stock Exchange. And uh, we have an EV of over 500 million US dollars. So CUDA is basically going to be built to the same model and now I'm going to take you through CUDA and how we're going to and grow and build and sell that company. I might add that the, the five key people that are involved in building and selling all of these companies currently work at CUDA with me and they are engineers and geologists and geophysicists. Our primary asset is in the Powder River Basin. The Powder River Basin is in northeast Wyoming. 
and I'm calling it the Permian of the Rockies because it's as good as the Permian, if not better, and I'll walk you through that. Um, we acquired this asset through a lifelong relationship with a private company uh, who acquired uh, the Barron's Flats unit from Chesapeake two years ago. We acquired a 28% working interest in 25,000 acres for 31 million US dollars and some stock. And that company is called Atomic. Atomic is our largest shareholder. They also took paper in the deal. Since then, we've done another acquisition at Coal Creek. So we blocked up 42,000 gross acres, 13,000 net, which is a significant position for a company our size. So all the big boys are in here, and what they're doing is drilling horizontally in multiple stack pay zones. So this is the Cretaceous stack. When you look at the wells that are currently being drilled by uh, EOG, Devon, Anadarko, e uh, Chesapeake, it's all horizontal drilling. And they're getting wells three to 4,000 barrels a day equivalent, primarily light oil. The difference between the Powder River Basin and the Permian is it doesn't produce a lot of gas, it doesn't produce a lot of water, and the wells are about 60% of the capital cost of what you would pay to drill the same well in the, in the Delaware Basin or the Permian Basin of Texas. Additionally, you've typically got two to three op opportunities on your land base. Certainly not all eight will pay uh, on one particular acre, but we have six prospective horizons uh, on, on our block. So it may not look like it, but we're the 12th largest landowner in the Permian Basin at 42,000 uh, gross acres. Land costs have escalated dramatically. You know, we got our position for about $300, and that's the way we like to, to build our company, get in cheap, get in early, and get out. And I'm gonna show you a very interesting slide that pertains and works for every oil and gas play in the world, whether it's horizontal, vertical, or just a land play, and it, it, it never fails me. Let's talk a little bit about takeaway. We don't have any of the issues that are you know we're, we're struggling with in Alberta today because we're in a spot that is very, very egress, egress friendly from a pipeline standpoint. We basically get paid WTI less 250, and Sinclair comes to our well sites, picks it up with a truck, and hauls it away, so we have no trucking costs which basically is the foundation for our low operating costs, which is about three to four dollars a barrel. Our net backs at $65 WTI are 52 Canadian. I, I don't think there's any Canadian producers that have $52 net backs. Um, you can move your crude anywhere. You can move it in from Guernsey into to Cushing. Once you're producing, you can go through Rollins into Salt Lake and go West Coast, Vegas. It's just a great place to be and operate. There's about a million a day of pipeline capacity that's unused. And the bottom line here shows the, the price of the crude to the differential. So sometimes it's above, sometimes it's below. I think I went too far. So the primary and initial play and the reason we got involved here was a play very similar to what's being developed in Alberta called the Cardium play. It's the oldest known vertical and now water flooded play in, in the province in the Cretaceous. The reason it's similar is because it's the exact same age as the cardium. So when you think of Canadian producers that are drilling horizontally in the bioturbated zone in the cardium and, and that produces a drill vertically, you think of companies like Yangara, Inplay, guys that are drilling around the known proven resource. What we have here is actually very interesting. It's a, originally was a one well pool two years ago. This well right here was the only producer in the pool, which is this curve here. The, that well has made 140,000 barrels in seven years. So when my friend acquired it, uh, he bought a one well pool, not knowing it was gonna be a township in size, thinking it was maybe three or four sections. Well, he drilled the green dots, which were the 16 producers, and, and went, this thing's big, I need a partner. This is where CUDA came in. We came in and took a third of his uh, working interest, and now we've drilled an additional 11 wells uh, this year, and uh, it looks like we're gonna be able to drill another 60. So that would be equivalent to finding a cardium pool in 1955 in Alberta, drilling 160 acre vertical wells that pay out in eight months to a year with IPs of 150 barrels a day, 150 EUR, 
with $52 net backs at $65. Pretty phenomenal project, just on primary. What we're doing now is we're in the middle of applying for a secondary recovery unit. A secondary recovery unit is a gas flood or a water flood. In this case, we'll be using gas because it's around, it's available, and it's cheap, and it works better than water. We've done a uh, third-party independent model of the, of the pool, and we expect to increase the primary recovery from 15% to over 50% by converting every fourth well in each section to a gas injection. So we're currently putting a lot of capital into building the plant. Um, the plant will have fractionation, compression, uh, condensate recovery, and then we'll be able to uh, put the gas we're producing plus makeup gas into the reservoir, which will dramatically increase the production, probably at least double the production. And if you get 50%, it will actually triple the, the reserves from about 150,000 a well to about 450 recoverable per well. So that's a big delta for us. Um, the timing of that is expected to be online this summer. We expect to get approval in March. We'll start our injectivity in, in March. Uh, we have a midstream division in this company called Converse Transport. Uh, we'll be building a seven mile, uh, eight inch high pressure line down to tall grass. Uh, where we'll set a tap into that line and we'll bring in makeup gas to feed the missable flood. So that's our primary project. We will drill another 20 wells at least um, in 2019 and uh, we'll, we'll build out the missable flood and try and get that gas in the ground to grow our production. So a great primary play, but a play that has great upside uh, from a secondary recovery standpoint. The other thing we've got going on is looking at the stack is we've got two very low risk horizontal plays. We just completed this acquisition last month. We paid $3 million for 11,000 acres, which is a real bargain for an old field that has produced out of the Shannon, 9 million barrels, but we're not interested in the Shannon because it's depleted. What we are interested in is the Frontier 2. Um, it has produced from 20 wells, and there's 120 million barrels of oil in place on the structure in the Frontier 2. The wells are low permeability, so they produce 20, 30, 40, 50,000 barrels. They're just not really commercial, but they set up nicely for horizontal drilling. So we're going to license a couple of wells here next month, and we're going to drill our first horizontal well, a two-mile lateral, for $5 million in the Frontier 2. We have a 33.3% working interest in that block. Um, it's going to work. Um, I expect IPs about 750 to 1,000 barrels a day of 35 degree gravity crude. I have about 100% internal rate of return at $60 strip pricing on WTI. Um, we'll have about 50 locations uh, gross uh, in the Frontier 2. We also like the Dakota in here. Um, it's also a horizontal target. The second horizontal well we'll drill will be in the summer over on Barron's Flats unit. And of course, these are the, the Shannon wells we currently have drilled and are producing. It's keying off a well that was drilled by World Energy. World Energy is a private equity backed company and they were running around here drilling Frontier 1 wells and you can see this well IP for 1500 barrels a day out of the Frontier 1. That well is about six miles from us and there's another vertical well here that made 400,000 barrels. So our plan is to come in and we're, we've got three deep wells that have good bypass pay in the Frontier and drill a two mile lateral well in June. Uh, it'll probably be about $7 million, 30 stages, 150 tons a stage. We expect similar results to what Wold got, about 1,500 barrels a day. That well's made 220,000 barrels in nine months. It paid out in four months. So these are pretty stellar economics. We would have 54 locations on half of our land base in the Frontier 2, excuse me, in the Frontier 1. So pretty robust, um, low risk drilling. Um, We've got additional targets below it, but those are the two that we're primarily focused on. This is the key slide that you have to remember when you're running an oil and gas company and you're organically driven. You gotta get in early and you gotta get out at the right time. And if you look at all the companies I've built and sold, we've been very fortunate to get out at the right time. We did ride one through the recession. And, you know, that was a, a long haul. I don't wanna do that again. So we're always looking at the macro. So we know we're in early. We're in a great spot. People are trying to get into the powder. 
someone's going to come in and we'll have an opportunity as we mature the asset to exit before we have another downturn in crude. It always happens when oil goes to 100, you're going to have a downturn. It's going to happen 6 to 12 months after oil hits 100, and you got to be ready to make your move. So we'll be going hard to generate you know, the asset, build the PDP, build a production base. We now have all the land we need. It's all about drilling, execution, and building value for our shareholders. So we own 35% of the company. I think uh, if, you, if you look at why you would buy into this company, because we've done it six times before, we've never blown up a company. We own 35% of the company. We've got great institutions in here. And I think that's a testament to the fact we actually raised money in this crappy market. We closed on seven million last week. We're still trying to close on a couple more million. Um, we have access to capital through the capital markets. We also have access through um, secondary markets. You can't get a bank line in Canada if you're a junior company. You gotta have 5,000 barrels a day, operated 80% oil. So you have to use secondary means to finance your company, which we've done. Um, so we, we've got a strong base there, um, loyal shareholders, and we're putting, we have a lot of skin in the game, which is always something you wanna see from management. Guys are putting money up. I put money in every financing, every company I built has ever, done, has ever issued, whether it's a buck or five bucks. So we're always in there. Um, Wyoming is a stellar asset. It's multi-zone. It's got phenomenal netbacks. No headwinds on aggress or egress for pipelining, uh, getting oil and gas out of the property. Um, the surface is owned by one rancher. So no problems building roads, building pipe, you don't have to consult any Indian bands. There's no problem. It's like Texas. It's just, just go. Um, this is an excellent time to get into the energy space because everything's beat up so badly. Our stock's no different. Um, so it, you got to look for the, for the companies that have the ability to grow. Cash flow, reserves that are going to be valuable, don't have impediments to markets. And uh, you got to go with management teams that have done it before and you'll do very, very well. I think we're in, a, you know, you, it's hard to believe today, but I think we're in a, in a commodity super cycle, whether it's gold, oil, gas, base metals. The trend is still there, and there's always downturns in trends. You got 100 million barrels a day of production. You got an excess of about one to 1.2 million a day in production. And you got several countries falling off the planet, like Venezuela. So it's not that great of a balance, it's just, you know, near-term politics and algorithmic selling, and that's the way it goes in the oil business. That could turn around tomorrow, production cuts, and then it's, it's back on. I think the first half of 19 is choppy for crude, but I think the second half is gonna be really excellent for crude. And I think 2020, when this new maritime law comes in and they can't use all that crappy oil to push those boats around the world, that takes about three and a half million barrels off the page. Well, that's, there's going to be cheating and all the other stuff, but it's going to take a lot of oil off the page. It's got to be replaced with light, sweet, volatile, crude versus, you know, heavy mine stuff that, because of the carbon footprint. And I don't know if you people know about that, but the Maritime Association has mandated that every boat in the world, whether it's pushing oil or pushing uh, cars around, has got to be 0.5 carbon emission versus the current standard of 3.5. So that's... That's a six X on what do they got to do to improve their ability to push boats around the world. So that's, that's January 1, 2020, that's coming into play. Um, so I think that is a big thing to watch on global consumption. So that's the, the company. I can talk about other things, but um, that's what we got. This report brought to you by the Richmond Club, where investors and high growth companies meet.